San Carlos, I don't believe, is here this morning. He said he uh, had an emergency uh, okay. at his uh, office. Uh, good morning. For those that don't know me, I'm Scott Vanderbrook. I currently serve as the fire chief of Sterile Fire Rescue. Been here 20 years, just finishing up my 10th year as chief. Um, and I'm dressed this way because I volunteer at schools on Friday. So I'm going back to my the school and volunteer after uh, this. I was there this morning. Um, just a couple of brief things. Um, everybody's watching Florence, Hurricane Florence. Uh, don't forget about Isaac. Some of the projections this morning, even though it's not a storm right now, could come up into the Gulf and we could get some weather from it. So we just got to keep an eye on that. We're a long ways away from the end of our hurricane season. And if you remember what happened here a year ago, so just be mindful of uh, that. Uh, our budget uh, was set last uh, Wednesday night, uh, this Wednesday night. Uh, we had our first public hearing. Uh, budget was presented to the commissioners. Uh, the millage rate of 2.13 and our second hearing will be uh, next week. The Fallen Firefighter Memorial will be coming up October 12th in Ocala. And the reason I bring that up is that we actually have two firefighters over the history of a sterile fire rescue that died in the line of duty. So we typically send somebody up uh, to that uh, in Ocala for the National or for the Florida Fallen Firefighters uh, Memorial. I remember I talked to you last month about purchasing a new engine this year because it saved us a lot of money. We did purchase it and we'd already paid for it. Uh, and we get a 2% prepaid uh, discount. It'll be about eight, 10 months before we receive that, that engine in. Um, speaking of volunteering in the schools, I had a great meeting with uh, Nick Betos the other day, myself and Chief Canberry, um, on how the fire districts are going to help out with the uh, school program that the village entered into. We already do a lot in the schools. We're in the Sterile High School, and we're in Pinewoods, but there are some other things that we can do in the schools uh, through that village program. So we'll be working with the schools to volunteer uh, w when we can to help them out. The last thing that I have is that we'll be doing a community risk assessment this year. Uh, basically a community risk assessment is because of the massive amount of growth that's been going on or going to be going on. It takes a hard look at the village and the sterile fire district to make sure that we have the proper resources through prevention, public education, emergency operations and EMS to keep up with the high density uh, growth that will be going on in the village in our, in our area. So we're gonna have that assessment and hopefully we'll have that done in about eight months and it'll give us a roadmap on really, are we doing the right things for the village? Do we have the proper stations? Do we have the proper people? Um, and we're gonna do a third party on that just so that it's non-biased and there's somebody else looking at our organization uh, to make sure we're going in the right direction. I'll open it up for any questions anybody has of a sterile fire rescue. Yes. Thank you for mentioning uh, Hurricane Isaac. We cannot get any information from the local news media, so is there any local link or website that we could uh, track it on? 
They're, they're, I've been just going through the National Weather Service, NOAA, or the Weather Channel, Weather Underground, um, and they put out a couple times a, a day um, all the different storms that are out there in, in their projected path of Isaac. Right now, it's, not, it's got a lot of wind shear. It's not really a storm. But if you look at the spaghetti models, it continues to bring it lower and then turning back up somewhere in the Gulf. But it could be absolutely nothing, or it could develop depending on the warm waters in the Gulf. So just try to monitor NOAA or the Weather Channel. Uh, that's kind of where I've been getting my information right now. I haven't been getting it from there either. I, they're, they're so focused on up north. I, I know. I do get a, I do get a uh, twice a day, I do get a confidential email list um, from FEMA, but that's not something I'm really going to distribute because it talks about where our resources are in Florence, who's here, what we're doing. So it's not really a public document. But if something really changes, I'll make sure that we get it out to the ECCL. And we continue, just like we did with Irma, um, we're very connected with the Village's webpage and our webpage. So if there's anything going on, we make sure that all that stuff gets get out on the, the web pages. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. And nobody from uh, Shankar. No, Dave sent an email to Bob this morning. He said he had a great Thank you. So the uh, next order of business is a presentation by the mayor, Jim Bosch, uh, on the bit what's going on with the village. So with, with that, Jim, uh, appreciate your being here. Okay. Good morning to all. It's always great to be here with the ECCL. I did uh, take a little time to make a little little uh, funny story for you guys because I know you guys always look for something like that. The story goes like there's a Texan who walks into a pub in Ireland and he clears his voice and says to the crowd of drinkers, I hear you Irish bunch of ha are hard drinkers. I'll give 500 American dollars to anybody who can drink 10 pints of Guinness back to back. The room is quiet and no one takes up the, te the Texans offer. One man even leaves. 30 minutes later, the same gentleman who left the show comes back and taps the Texan on the shoulder and he says, is your, is your bet still good? And the Texan says, sure and asked the bartender to line up 10 pints of Guinness on the bar. Immediately, the Irishman tears into the 10 pints of Guinness, drinking them all back to back. The other pub patrons cheer as the Texan sits in amazement, and the Texan gives the Irishman the $500. He says, hey, if you don't mind me asking, where did you go for that 30 minutes before I, I gave the challenge. The Irishman replies, oh, I had to get down to the pub down the street to see if I could do it first. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning, uh, I promised you I was here, last time I was here, that we would talk, I would come and give you a report on the budget, which is very important. Uh, where we're at, I would like to say that we've been through two phases so far. Uh, next Thursday at 5.30, we have our second budget meeting. Uh, the council has to vote on the budget for, for that time uh, next Thursday. So uh, by state requirements, we're required to have three meetings on it. We've had two so far, and Thursday is the third. So in turn, I'd like to, I'd like to, to, to go and talk to you about our budget. So the first thing we talk about the budget is that, as I told you, we're going to, so if our current budget rate is 7798, and remember, we've reduced it each year that we've been in operation. On the 20th, and again, this is not for sure until the 20th, I'm just one member of the council, we are going to reduce our budget. <coughs> Can we make this go down, Peter? It's the right arrow. Right arrow. Oh. Okay. You can make, we're going to recommend that we have a budget 
of 775, which is a reduction for the third year in a row. Now, in conjunction with the discussion we're gonna have on the property today, you have to say that's a pretty fairly good thing that we're doing, okay? So, we go to the, I, I'm in a group with all the mayors of the other six cities, and they all say to me, Jim, Jim, you know, well, I think it's apparent that in our discussion as we started to, the incorporation of Cerro, that government light is the way to go, and even uh, our neighbor Bonita Springs has got, as you read in the paper, has got some major problems with theirs. One of the problems that we're working on now is that in order to establish a firm, a complete uh, incorporation, you must have your charter, which we established at the beginning. You must have a comprehensive plan. And in conjunction with the ECCL, almost half of the comprehensive plan was done and it took us another year and, and probably about uh, $200,000 to finish off the comprehensive plan. We've turned it to the state. They've sent it back for some suggestions. Hopefully we'll get that finalized in the next two or three months. The second thing that's just as important is the land development ordinances. We do not have official land development ordinance in process now and we are so fortunate to have Howard Levitan, who's a former a land attorney working. It is, a, it is a project as big as the comprehensive plan. And it will, it will amount to a lot of objections, especially by attorneys, as, as Don can tell you, because we are going to stick to a stricter course than most other people have in, in their land development order. And so we have to be prepared. If, if if the lawyers are going to come at us and sue us, we have to prepare. So we have a reserve. I don't think it'll be any anywhere in that, but we want to make sure that they understand that we're going to be prepared. If they don't like what we're doing, that we're going to stick to the legal boundaries as well. So that will be coming up in the right right as we go forward. The second part of this this whole uh, budget that we're doing is we have finished a five-year CAP capital improvement program and that capital improvement program will amount to 128 million dollars that we will be spending in the next five years of which 77 or almost 78 million will come out of the of, out of Estero's uh, coffers the rest will be state and county contributions to the program this is some of the this is some of the things that we'll be working on. Star Road Parkway begins next year, right after spring, right after the season's over. We'll be starting at Star Road Parkway, finishing it next year. Uh, we're looking at that problem at Williams Road and Will and Walgreens, as we're all familiar. We come out of that that entrance there, and you got to turn right. And is it right? Is it wrong? Is it against the law and so forth? So we are very much aware that something has to be done to resolve that. So we'll be working with the police department and FDOT uh, in terms of the light and the county and see how we can re resolve it. We need to get some turn lanes at uh, Stero High School. As you saw in the paper last week, the high school's got all these guys peeling out there. We don't really have that problem uh, per se, but uh, in conjunction with the request, we're going to be working on that. As you know, uh, the county is talking about ultimately uh, six-laning Corkscrew Road. They've written to us, told us that they've they'd have made five million dollars towards the project and expected to get for design, expected to get underway by uh, 2020. Whether that happens or not, that's a flip of the coin. But uh, and anyhow, that's what they tell us. We will have to do the upgrades on landscaping. They have a basic landscaping. We'll have to do the upgrades there, so we're preparing for that. We're going to we're going to do a a complete uh, landscape up, upgrade on US 41, and that will start in the spring. And in conjunction with that, we're going to put a st nice a sterile monuments on on the uh, uh, south southern part and the northern part of US 41. So I'm sure you will be proud when you drive along all of 41 and you come into a stereo, you'll be proud of how a stereo looks and represents itself in the upgrade of the landscape. And then uh, 
over in Trailside and Point Siena, they, as you know, they're dirt dirt roads and they're having problems. So we're we're going to uh, um, black type that so that uh, they have a, a genuine road. Now the reason I, I point this out here, <coughs> here's here are the other ones that I talked about. The reason I point that out is that, as you can see here, this is our capital improvement budget. Okay, and there are so many projects that we're doing in the next five years. I could not, it would take me the whole meeting to go over this whole thing. So what I'm recommending you doing, go into our Estero Florida website and you will see it listed. And you'll see every single project that we're undertaking in the next five years on our capital improvement program. Now, it doesn't mean that they're all gonna get done, but you'll see the projects that we're listing. And, and you can see the list is, is, is extensive. And so this is what I'm saying that we're going to be projecting ourselves to $128 million worth of work to be done here in Estero, and of which the county, uh, with Estero will pay $78 million. So just go into the website and you'll find CIP, the Capital Improvement Program for 2018 to 2023. So, so if you have any questions, get to me after the meeting. This is how extensive it is. Last week we had a workshop, and Jim, Jim and Don are going to talk about this here too. We started our process. As you know, we're working on thinking in terms about the concept of a, of a sterile. And I had a developer call me and tell me we're making all the wrong moves, and I appreciate it. Everybody has the right to their own thinking. But from my standpoint, if we're going to have the sterile that everybody, 99% of my opinion of the people want, we can't have a cinder block in every bit of glass. And so we are lacking in some parks and, and green space. And so we have made a commitment to start venturing into the area of pur purchasing property that will protect us in that particular area. First property that has come up is the property on Corkscrew Road in 41, known as the Old College of Life property, among other things, they have other people there. The problem we have in that is that in 2008, the people who own that property went to Lee County and has all the permits to do that property. They can do most anything they want there with commercial and residential, uh, and so all of that, all of that would be developed because it's going to, and it's an expensive piece of property and the developer is going to use every bit of land in order to get his money back. The main reason is that the Estero River runs through that property. And as the Estero River runs through that property, then obviously the protection of the banks is important. The permit for that, uh, for the banks on the Estero River is 50, 50 feet, which is, on either side, which will never protect the river. So there are a lot of things. Uh, we, we feel strongly that that whole concept should be protected, where, as you can see, a developer comes in, he's going to knock down whatever he can in order to make money. So actually, our, own, our only alternative in this, in order to protect that land, is to buy the land. Now, uh, the confusion on this is that we don't intend to own the entire 62 acres. We intend to see if we can find uh, business people who would be willing to put a building in there in accordance with the environment there. And we look to see if we can sell some of that property as we go along to bring uh, the, the, uh, the property that we own uh, to a minimum. So uh, we would hope that we can retain at the end at least 25% of that property certainly the property along the river and that beautiful area that's that's along the river that we have so it's really divided into two parcels which jim and, and don will tell you about actually north and south south of the river and north of the river so in conjunction there's a place in there that's a sort of a sanctuary that ellen uh, peterson donated years ago and called Hep hepatachi and they are in 
and right now they are in negotiations with the, the Southwater Conservancy to see if they will take over that land. So if that happens and in conjunction with our thoughts of protecting the river and protecting that whole area, then it certainly would bring an area of, of a sanctuary, of a park, a place where people can walk. Now please understand that that property is directly across from Corishan Park. And the river goes under US 41, out the park and out to the estuaries and out to the bay and out to the river, okay? We are now, and again, remember, none of this has been voted on, so, but the council is totally aware of it, you know? We are in discussion. Uh, Steve uh, Sarkozy and myself went to, to uh, Tallahassee last uh, spring and met with the uh, DEP uh, undersecretary, and we feel that we could do a better job of maintaining a nice park at the Correction uh, Park. So that's our position. I think every probably would agree with for the most part. I think it needs to be upgraded. We need to have areas where people can picnic and we can possibly have a historic village over there. That Boomer property is beautiful. There's no reason why you can't have meetings over there. You can't have weddings and everything else over there. And uh, certainly some of the areas have to be upgraded. It is the canoeing and kayaking and boarding program is going exceptional over there. And so now you can see if we have that river that goes and goes over to the, to the park and it's all joined together, what a benefit that's going to be to us here in the future. So that's where we're coming from. And on, uh, on thir uh, last uh, Thursday, we did have a consensus. It was a workshop, so we can't vote. And the consensus was unanimous that we would we would go forward with the purchase of the, of the property. Uh, we have two different alternatives, which I'll show you on financing, but uh, on this Thursday, we will probably be finalizing that, that, uh, that agreement to purchase and giving the <coughs> town manager the authority to go forward and see uh, if we can no nego negotiate a, a final price that would be acceptable. So that is the situation on, uh, on, from a financing standpoint. I'm sure Don and uh, Jim can talk to you about the environmental uh, situation and everything else. So, so this says, shows that there was 62 acres was on the property, um, that the financial impact will not affect our budgeting schedule at all. We will be able to finance that entire project and keep on going. We, uh, our goal is to have uh, 12 months of um, operational budget in place. We have gone from five to seven. We will be 10, yum, 10 months this year, and hopefully next year we'll hit the 12-month goal where we have full operational schedules in place in case of a disaster emergency, which I don't think of the six communities I'm involved with, I don't think anyone can even come close to that, that uh, financial situation. So that's the important thing. So the final thing I want to go into is the, the combination that we're going to do on budget. Uh, actually, this is the park where we have kayaking. Remember, it goes under the bridge. And maybe not someday we can work together. Uh, we're working to see if we can some, bring some, some excellent uh, park features. And I don't want to get into them now. But we have met with the state on three occasions now. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, they had $150 million damages in with Irma the, in their state parks, 175 <laughs> parks. And so they don't have a lot of money to work on parks, whereas it would be a great deal if we can partner with them <coughs> and bring that whole asset together of the, of the College of Life property that we're talking about buying in conjunction with the, with the Corishan Park together. So uh, I, I'm sure you're gonna find it was the best thing that we're looking at. And as we go forward, we need to get some Little League fields. We have no Little League fields. They're gonna have to go to, to Collier County. Uh, soccer fields, we have to get, uh, and I think you will find that we will be working in conjunction with the school system in order to do that whole, this whole project to make it a recreational facility for all of the residents of Cerro. Huh? So, 
Just to finish off, I just want to let you know that the options that we have on financing the property, and the first option we have is to do a 30-year payoff uh, and spread, spread the, the, the requirements out at a smaller rate and longer period of time, or a seven-year payoff. And I think it'll all, whatever we decide, remember, if we sell a piece of property, that money will go towards paying off the, the money that we have for the, the, the loan that we have for that property. So it's not, a, it's not a situation where we're talking about we're buying a piece of property for $25 million, and that's what it's going to be, and we're on the hook for it all the time. I think you'll find that within two or three years, we definitely will find people that would be interested in joining in and making that the park. Uh, originally, the presentation was to make that a town hall area and uh, even put a theater in that area. So uh, we'll all work together and make sure that that, that gets done. So that's, uh, the, this is where we are today. I think you'll find in terms of financial situations and everything else, there is no, no municipality in this area here that is in, in as good a shape as we are. I think many of the other communities are very, very envious of how we are and how we're able to, to do this and plan ahead for what we're gonna do. But I think in 10 years, we'll be the best state in the state of Florida with, with a full plan that we have going. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay. participate. You end up coming to these meetings and uh, listen to a lot of talk uh, directed at you about different uh, topics. But uh, every, every month we like to have a few minutes where you can tell us if there are new issues that are uh, occurring in your part of the community. Uh, not interested in, in national issues or statewide issues, but rather those kinds of things that uh, are happening right here where, that we don't know about, that we need to know about, and hopefully could uh, help you to address. Uh, does anybody have anything this morning? <laughs> I'll speak at once. Uh, we're going to make up for some of Jim's time. Going along with what the mayor just said, uh, Bella Terra has um, been fighting for the last seven, eight years between the county and the village the developer of our property who still owned 12 acres in front of us. And we fought him at the county level to, when he was trying to get it rezoned and un unfortunately for him, he couldn't get it done before we became a village. And, it, and we've had three different trips to the village for different proposals. And I think the residents of Bellaterra did the right thing. They decided to try and enter an agreement with the developer to purchase the land. 70% uh, of the community voted to purchase the land, and we're in the process of closing that right now. And so, do you know how you're going to use it? Uh, right now, we're thinking the same way that uh, the village is. We don't know, but we want to control whatever it is. Right. We only have one entrance in and out of Bella Terra for 1,900 homes and over 5,000 cars that we have registered. So. Um, the county has frustrated every attempt we've had to put a second emergency exit out of, out of there. And so that's really the only way we had to go. Uh, everything that, that the developer wanted to do was high density, uh, from apartment buildings to 100% uh, commercial to uh, a mixed commercial with townhomes. Uh, so, that would have been exiting right at the gate into our condo development, and right. it would have been a, a <coughs> tough road to hold the amount of traffic on Bellaterra Boulevard. Thank you for the report, and keep us informed. Sure. As to how that proceeds. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, comments or suggestions? Okay. Uh, I did. I skipped over announcements. Does anybody? I don't have any announcements. Anybody have any announcements uh, of events that are? people want to know about? If not, we'll proceed. Uh, next uh, item of business on the, uh, on the agenda is the bike pad uh, 
master plan holder view uh, with uh, Ned, Jake, Ned Baer of Jacobs Engineering. Ned, uh, appreciate you being here. Look forward to your presentation. You want to introduce him, Bob? Yeah, I do. <coughs> Ned was a successful bidder for the uh, bike pad master plan. This is a $100,000 program that will be uh, sponsored by um, <coughs> the NPO. <laughs> uh, and uh, Jacobs was a successful bidder, had a tremendous background in the area of putting this kind of a program together, and I think is going to do an excellent job. And with that, Ned, would you give us a, a little overview? Okay. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I wasn't sure I was going to get here. I don't have a joke, but I'll tell you a short story. <laughs> My day began in West Palm Beach this morning. I've been at a statewide planning conference for a couple of days. And so I, you know, I had a car rental. So uh, I thought you know, I'd get up really early and kind of just mosey over here, nice relaxing drive. So I go downstairs to get my car, and it was one of those valet parking. You didn't have any choice. Valet, that's it. So of course, the manager came back and he said, I lost your key. I said, no, no, you did He said, yes, we lost your key. So at about 6 AM this morning, I was really stressed out. And he said, uh, we're still looking around for it. Uh, don't worry. Uh, so I was really worried. <laughs> I was about ready to call you, Bob, at about 7 o'clock, but uh, he, he runs in around 7.30, says, hey, uh, we found the key. Thank goodness. So you can make it from West Palm Beach uh, to Estero in about two and a half hours, or less than that. <laughs> less than that. So um, anyhow, um, so it's good to be here, and uh, we were selected to... Uh, uh, develop your bicycle pedestrian master plan. This will be the first one for the village uh, ever. And we think it's really important because um, you've never really had a plan just addressing biking and walking and making the community uh, a better place to walk and bike and make it safer. You think about the most attractive communities cities, towns across the country to live in or visit, and what's the commonality? I mean, to me, they're, they're really uh, pretty places to walk and bike. I mean, that's one of the commonalities, and I'm sure many of you travel or travel with your, your business, and so um, this is really an attempt to improve the quality of life uh, for the community, and the Lee County MPO is funding this uh, project uh, I guess the village staff has wanted to, to undertake this in council for some time, so we're anxious to get going. Uh, we just got the notice to proceed last week uh, from the MPO. We have a kickoff meeting next week with uh, the MPO and, and the village staff, and then we are going to establish a project advisory committee that's going to, uh, we're going to meet frequently during the course of this uh, study. It's an eight month long study. So we'll be done, uh, I think that's around next April, springtime. Um, and you know, we've done this before different in, in communities in Southwest Florida too. We recently completed the plan in the city of Cape Coral, uh, the town of Fort Myers Beach. We did a feasibility study to extend the JYLP trail uh, for the city of Fort Myers, and th that was just wrapped up. Um, it's really important, uh, we, you know, we want to show some vision and what's maybe possible as far as new uh, trails, uh, both on street and off street type of improvements. You have an opportunity with the uh, statewide Sun Trail network. You've got the railroad corridor that bisects the community. So there are some opportunities. You've got the county that's going to be upgrading corkscrew. Um, Part of our scope is to work with the county and maybe we can pr present them some um, design alternatives while they're developing some corkscrew things to look at a shared use path along the roadway, uh, some other types of crossing improvements. Um, but we want to make a, 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 a realistic plan and we want it implementable. Uh, so 
we have been directed to come up with a five-year list of priorities that would be considered for funding, either local, state, or federal, uh, put some cost estimates to it. Uh, because, you know, when you ask for money from someone else, the first thing they say, is it in the plan? And so um, up until now, it's been, a, it's been harder for you to kind of uh, uh, obtain some of those state and, and federal grant opportunities. So this will make it easier for you. Um, I just wanted to real quickly talk about some of the public uh, engagement uh, opportunities. I mentioned we're going to have a project advisory committee, and that's going to be made up of uh, different uh, community leaders. I'm sure there's several of you in the room that will be part of this group. And uh, it'll probably be about a dozen people, include uh, people from education and law enforcement, uh, uh, community advocates. Um, and they will kind of monitor the progress and then at different points in time, um, you know, give us recommendations on how to proceed. So that's one, one uh, public engagement tool. The other thing we're going to do is something called Wikimap. It's an online um, social uh, media tool. Uh, so you get it on the web. Uh, it's very interactive. Um, we've used it in different areas before. Uh, for Charlotte County, we had about 500 people respond, which is really good, we thought, uh, because you typically don't get that at public workshops. Um, for the city of Cape Coral, we had several thousand people comment about, you know, where are places you should consider, you know, bicycle and, and walking improvements? Where are problem spots? You can actually down, download uh, pictures and other information on the website for the team to analyze. So Wikimap will be, should be, um, there'll be a link, the village website, uh, possibly the MPO website, and that'll be coming online probably about the first part of November. And that'll stay open, you know, really throughout the study for, for several months. We also have uh, two public workshops identified the first probably being in November, the second probably in February or March. Um, we will have more, uh, you know, this type of presentation as we get into the uh, analysis and a potential list of projects. I'd like to come back to your, your committee at some point. Um, we also want to keep uh, uh, website available both the village the MPO Lee County uh, then also you know work with the media for any opportunities we have uh, so um, that's really all I have today I just you know thank you for the invite um, we have a really strong team uh, you know I can't do this alone we've got about 10 people that will be working on bits and pieces of this plan uh, a couple of local uh, Folks, you probably know around my, our, my team, uh, Bill Spikowski. I've worked with Bill on other uh, things. He's a he's a great resource person. So Bill Bill knows a lot of information. Um, Alta Planning and Design. They are a um, nationwide firm. Just all they do is bike pad plans. They're very good. We've worked with them before, so they can really add some uh, great information to our team. And then we've got several engineers that will be helping us look at some of the, the crossings, some of the uh, typical sections of improvements, either for shared use paths or bike lanes or sidewalk improvements. So we have a really strong team. So uh, thank you, and uh, we'll be back. So if there's any questions. So we did, we've already won about two and a half years that those people, a lot of them the system that we've went through in historic parkland. So that's done. And we're going to be starting it, so maybe you can take a look at that in, in conjunction with all, all the other stuff that you're doing. Sure. And then, you know, it, it reminds me, we did the uh, town of Fort Myers Beach uh, uh, bike ped master plan. And, you know, the county was right in the middle of all that work down there with the, the, the highway. And so we still looked at some of the uh, design, and we, we did make some recommendations for some of the crossing improvements, how to improve it, and so mm -hmm. forth. So uh, we have a good relationship, I think, with Lee County that I think will serve us well for this study. Sure. 
sure. ability to <clears throat> some of our other Lee County communities because we have the same problem with all yeah. the six lane and four lane highways. How do people get across them effectively and safely? Sure. Um, That's and a real challenge. It's a, it's a big challenge, and, you know, it's the speed of traffic, and then it's the traffic volume. But I think in southwest Florida, you know, so often uh, this area has been mentioned nationwide about bicycle and pedestrian crashes. It's typically in the top ten, uh, more than, you know, even in the, in, in the nation. Uh, and a lot of that's speed of traffic. But, you know, special types of warning beacons, um, there's, there's uh, this is sort of engineer talk, but like there's hawk signals and there's uh, uh, RRFB type of, these are, these are different sort of flashing lights. There's different sorts of paint that can be used to make crossings more visible. I know nationwide, a lot of communities for their bike lanes, they're making them wider there's a DOT standard now of seven foot bike lanes on roadways like US 41 and other arterials. And that's a new standard that just came out. It used to be like three or four feet. And you know, um, we're really going to try to make this plan for all ages and abilities. And so we understand that, you know, except for maybe some of the bicyclists that, that train on Saturday mornings or out there in their spandex, they may be comfortable on 41. But that's not most people. So it's, you know, you want it for neighbor, you know, neighborhoods and people with kids and, uh, you know, make it, make it safer. But those are the types of crossing improvements that we'll look at if, if maybe flashers and signs and some additional measures can be used at additional crossings. And we may identify some future crossings that will need to be addressed. The other thing I wanted to mention is we have a substantial ability to communicate with our community. 4,000 email addresses and a lot of social media and that yep. type of stuff. We've done a lot of things that generate a lot of input from people, so we'd be happy to work with you. That'd be great. And uh, in other studies, we've had Bike Walk Lee, that they've gotten information out about, about the planning process and how people can participate. So uh, we'll take you up on it. That's great. Thank you. Previously, Bill Spakowski, he, he's not a believer in pedestrians like bicycle overpasses. And, and I got to believe the majority of people in the room believe that's the only way you're going to cross 41. So I don't let him paint your study because he just doesn't believe in that. And, and yeah. I think that's a little short sighted, and I don't think that's a reflection of, of the community. So yeah, you know. Thank you for sharing that. You know, Bill, Bill has a relatively limited role as advisor, and I really want him primarily to focus on your, your plans, like, which he is really more, that's really his thing. We have, you know, more some traffic engineers and people like that. I will tell you, uh, for the Fort Myers project, uh, we have recommended an overpass for the JYLP trail over Colonial Boulevard for example, and we looked at other types of crossings and you're right, yeah. sometimes with traffic, you need to, to have the overpass. Now overpasses are expensive. You know, the one over Colonial is probably gonna be $4 million. Um, but, you know, high reward, it's gonna really increase usage. It's gonna be there a long time. So sometimes it's worth it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the program, we've been Hayden uh, from the Free Health uh, uh, Healthy Lifestyle Center. And uh, as you know, the uh, uh, Free Health Coconut Point facility has been open on December the 4th. And running up to that, uh, we need to do a lot of promotion. And Free Health needs to do a lot of promotion to get people educated and ready to Yeah, and thank you all for having me. Uh, again, my name is Ben Hayden with the Business and Community Relations team. Uh, so I will keep this kind of brief. As many of you guys know, Lee Health is opening the new Coconut Point facility uh, in December. Uh, ahead of that, my partner Molly Grubbs and I have been going out to different communities and doing presentations to residents to get them some information on exactly what the facility is going to do 
and also give them an opportunity to ask any kind of questions that they may, might have about the facility specifically. Um, so I wanted to make myself available here today afterwards. So if anybody's interested in scheduling one of those types of uh, presentations in your community, uh, please come find me afterwards. I will be happy to set that up. Uh, my, no my phone number, if you don't have time to stop afterwards, my phone number up, up there. Uh, and also my partner, Molly Grubbs, who you have probably seen here before. Um, thank you very much. I think that's it. Right. Yes, go ahead. I asked uh, about two months ago, maybe a little longer, the, the health committee and, and the Coconut Point facility, they're, they're trying to put a half-page article together that we can put in our newsletters on emergency room versus urgent care. And what, what's appropriate? Correct. Yeah. And, and it, it, the problem is, is I got to have it by the 5th of October to get in the November newsletter. Okay. And, and so, because we got a month lead time. So Absolutely. If you could get that and share that in the community through, through Don. I think that's a great idea. Us. Yeah, and I did, a, I did a presentation last year to a community specifically about that. What is urgent care? What is ER? What's appropriate for each? I can reach out to that presenter and get him to write up just a quick half page for yes, that. Absolutely. And I can, if I can get it to Dom to distribute yes. to everybody, and if they want to be able to share that, that's, right. that's fantastic. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. How long is your presentation? Uh, his present, the, the ER presentation? If you went to a community, how long is it? Uh, it typically takes 45 minutes. Uh, depending on how long the question and answer, really. So uh, Alex is the VP of the new facility. Typically, he'll go out and do the presentation. His portion, he does a lot of slides, uh, shows information, exactly what services will be there. He takes 25 to 30 minutes, and then there's another 20 or so minutes of, of question and answer. We're trying to get each community to have some health leaders. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that they they will take the responsibility for trying to get people in their community to understand more fully about all the health assets that are coming to the community because it's just one piece of it. Mm -hmm. You know, we we've, we've got a CON a, a certificate of need application. It's probably going to be decided in January or February, and then Lee Health has just bought 43 acres, you know, for additional development. And they're not going to sell any of that. They're going to lease it to different people so they can control the uses. And so this is a major, major <coughs> communication uh, and uh, investment opportunity uh, for the community. And uh, uh, we really need the support. Yes, Frank? Uh, yes, Alex Greenwood came into it already. Okay. We followed probably six weeks uh, ago. Now. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it answered to your question. It, 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 he spoke for maybe 40 minutes. We had a good 20 minutes of uh, question and answer dialogue. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a, maybe a little bit over an hour. Okay. Very well received. Very, uh, very well done. We had 53 people there, which was uh, you know a, a pretty good sized crowd. But I do understand that Lighthouse had a man. Uh, uh -huh. Over uh, over 100 people at Lighthouse, right? Standing room only. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, I know Molly and I have scheduled probably a dozen or so up to this point, but I know there's other communities out there that we haven't reached, so I wanted to make ourselves available to you all. And uh, before you go, I will have, we have a flyer that directs you to a website on the new facility. I'll leave it up on the table up there. Uh, grab one, it'll give you some more information. Or you can just pass them in a circle, that's fine. Herb had a ECCL tour of the facility. I know it's a question volunteers mm -hmm. and at that point Alex said they're in the process of setting up the procedure for that well the procedure is now in place <coughs> I was in touch with uh, Molly Grubbs and she put me uh, in touch with Gloria Ben Ventra and the process is very easy I'm volunteering okay the process fill out the application then you do a, a quick background check apparently there are no skeletons in my Great. Thank you. Uh, and one, one, one further comment, then, is that we've had two tours of the facility recently, about 15 people each. And the, uh, the people who took those tours really loved it and could, could really appreciate the wide diversity of services that are going to be offered by this new mm -hmm. facility. This is not an insubstantial uh, operation. Uh, starting in the middle of October, week, about a month from now, 
two days a week, there will be tours that will be offered <coughs> to people from different communities. And so uh, the more that people in your community know about this, the more we'll want to attend and participate in really learning about that. It's a great way to educate the leadership of your community. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody has any further questions? Uh, See me after. Uh, oh. Joe, uh, are you going to publicize when those tours are both? I'm sure. sure. Two previous ones. I was out of town. I couldn't attend, but I could really like to know. No, they'll be they'll be published. All this stuff will be published. And if you want to add it to your calendar, uh, November seventeenth is our our grand opening to the public. We're going to have all kinds of events. There's a five k uh, run that'll be kicking off. It's open to anybody. Uh, ahead of the, I think it's December 3rd, you know, open for operations. Um, and again, there will be tours going off uh, for the month prior to that. 17, it's Saturday. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you all. Thank you. You have a good day. Next on the agenda is a presentation by Jim Tatoulos about the land acquisition project that uh, Jim Bosch was talking about. Is to specify more about it and what we have done and what we plan on doing as we uh, look ahead to the rest of the process. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Uh, as you all recall, about a couple of years ago, before we started the comprehensive plan uh, in, in Estero, there was a mass wide village meeting where everybody came and gave inputs as to what they would like to see in Estero. And those, those goals uh, were, were stipulated and they were, they were uh, categorized. And then when the land plan was put together, the comprehensive land plan, they were taken into consideration. So one of the things that I want to point out is where we're at now compared to where we wanted to be. And uh, the thing is that when we talk about a comprehensive land plan, it's about a 30 to 35 year plan and it's a wish list of where you'd like to be in the future, where you'd like to take this village. One of the things included was we wanted to eventually to expand someplace. There's growth that's going to take us out where we're going to have to do some annexation. There's properties that, that are desirable. If we could get a developer to do things that, that uh, are there that would benefit the village, great. If they can't, then the village has been stepping forward to do it themselves. One reason for it is to do what the land plan called for, the comprehensive plan. Now, <clears throat> the circle uh, indicates where this property is that is being considered for purchase. If you notice, it's on the northern end of, of, of the village of Estero. The south end of the village of Estero has been where all the emphasis has been. That's where the Brooks has been. The development of the village started from there. The shopping center, now we've got the medical center that's down there. The village, uh, in, in cooperation with Lee, uh, bought the property, the south end once again. But now, the biggest growth potential is really the north side of Estero. And this property is probably the most, on the, probably most important intersection in the entire city. And the fact that the river is there is the emphasis for this property. But we gotta look at some other things. Across the street from this property is Korshan Park. And the mayor talked about cooperation with Korshan to try and do some expansion where we work together. One of the things I tried and failed, I wanted to get anybody that had a, a sterile address to be able to go to the park for free. They turned us down. <laughs> but I tried. Uh, so the, the one thing that you can see though that they were talking about is the Estero River goes, goes right through, right through the property, and here's Korshan, and, and, and there's, a, there's a bridge that goes over the, over the river, and one of the things the mayor was talking about is the ability, and you're talking about overpasses, we're talking about underpasses. If we get an underpass to connect this property with Korshan, what a great thing that would be. Further on, uh, further on down to the river going to the west, is the Boomer property, and that property eventually would come on board, and that'll be, that'll be tied in with all of this recreational area. And then further north, go back to the, uh, to the first uh, site there. To the north, 
up in this area, up here, there's additional property that hasn't been developed yet, but it's in the village. And so everybody's been ignoring it, but think of where the fire station is up there. And behind the fire station is a big piece of property. That's gonna be developed eventually. We've got the 100 acres, which is north of the Hertz uh, office building. That has not been developed yet. So one of the biggest emphasis of the future growth of Estero is gonna be on the north side of the village. So now well, let's go back to uh, the next site here. Now, if you notice, the, the river cuts the property in half. The, the, the south corner uh, at 41 and, and, uh, and Corkscrew, that's where the main intersection is. And if we concentrate on that property and going over to where Hepaashi is, that, that's that, that vacant piece in between. Um, and that whole piece there off of Corkscrew and 41 is probably the emphasis of this property. The property to the north has uh, is, is got the potential to be really valuable when the river gets developed. And it could, be, it could be really valuable and something that now the village would not undertake but we, would be available for substantial development with people that would have vision of what to do with it. And then that property would come on the market and that money would then come back to the village to take off some of the debt that we have for this property, which is, which is great. <coughs> um, now, if you'd go to the next slide for me, Pete. Here's, here's what we were talking about. Number one was the long range master plan. And that was the village vision we talked about. The village center concept included in this is we want to have recreation, we want to have civic facilities, we want to have walkable, walkable accessibility, and we want to have something that's open for use by everybody. You're, like you're talking, Mayor, uh, it may be a, 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 a theater, could be, could be an open air theater, it could be a whatever, but facilities that would benefit everybody. Then we go to parks and recreation. What do we have here? River accessibility. No accessibility to this river at all without having this property acquired. So that's, that's a big thing. Now we've got, we talked about the trails you just were talking about. Here we've got expansion of trails through this property, tying it into the Corshawn trails, and then all taking it over to where the railroad tracks are and expanding into that. So this is a key part. It could be like a rest stop in the, in the trails process. And then, <clears throat> then what we just mentioned ties into Corshawn into the Boomer properties. If you do the next one. The environmental concerns. One of the things we want to do is have clean waterways. We want to have preservation of historic trees. And so with Pete, Pete our, our, our committee leader here, there's a great opportunity to do a wonderful job of environmental properties. Now, the next thing is Estero as a whole. We've always talked about Estero being a destination city. And a destination city means incorporating all the things here. So we talk about the medical facilities that are coming now, and then we've got all these wonderful things that we could take place to the north. And then if you look to the, to the east, what's happening along Corkscrew with, what, 10,000 units eventually someday out there? So we, we've got a village there that's just, just booming. Now, we take, the, we take the master plan and the city plan, <clears throat> and here's where the most important part of this thing is, and that's the leadership to get this done. We are so fortunate to have Jim and to have our mayor, Nick, that started this thing, to have Ho Howard, who is a, a land planning attorney. We've got Mary Gibbs, who used to work for the city, uh, to the county for 30 years, that's doing our, 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 our uh, community development. We've got people here that are just so enthusiastic, putting it all together with somebody that we've got, very fortunate, Steve Sarkowski, to be our, our city manager, who's putting all this thing together. And where else have we got this happening? Probably no place in the entire state. 
All the things have all come together. And now, when you look at all of this, and take, if you go to the next step, uh, this is where it was zoned originally, but that zoning is for, that was for a commercial development type of thing. When we look at, when we look at what's gonna happen next, if you take our entire village as a whole, with all these different things that are taking place, I envision a competition for a, a land planning uh, corporation or uh, consultants to come in. And that's one of the things that we've had here. Estero has been very fortunate in getting some of the best consultants to guide them in doing th the directions for the city. I envision having a, a master land planning company that would come in there to look at a master plan for the entire area and then focusing it into the purchase of this property because, you know, should it be 200 feet off the river, 150, 175, 300? That's where the experts come in and, and they'll come. But first we have to buy the property and then after that the next thing will be how to, how to develop it, how, well how to design it rather. So with all of those things incorporated, I think we are the most fortunate village that I know of to have all these things happening and they have the great leadership to make it happen. The next thing I can say is we should all go to the next village meeting and it encourage them all to vote to buy this property. And oh, there was another one, uh, Pete. Uh, no, the financing options. The mayor talked about that, but that takes into the last part of this thing, Estero Light. Can you imagine the story I heard that when they first when it was in first incorporated, the mayor was hoping that we had a fifty thousand dollar surplus at the end of their first year. Miraculously, but well planned, we had three million. <laughs> so that shows you that they're doing something right. And we're, now we've got out of out of a plan to get a twelve month reserve of operating funds. You just said we're at ten months right now. Imagine that in three years. So. We're doing something right. We're gonna to continue to keep on going and a wonderful thing about it is it's something that all you people asked for in the beginning and our people are giving it to us. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanna supplement what Jim has talked about here on this, it's a very, very important issue. But uh, there were, there were <coughs> a small group of people who objected to the village getting involved in land acquisition and uh, started to raise a little bit of hell about it and try to uh, gain support for that. As a result of that, uh, we met with the county, with the village, and, and uh, learned about what their plans were and what their analysis was and all that type of thing so that we were in a position to uh, be able to encourage people to participate in the discussion. And uh, with the help of the Tapahatchee Center, uh, we got over 400 uh, emails to the council members in support of the uh, acquisition. Uh, I was told that there were eight that were opposed. Um, with Tapahatchee's help, uh, we had about 100 to 150 people attend the first meeting, uh, many of them in green shirts in order to show that they were supportive of, of going ahead with this project. And uh, at least uh, half a dozen of us spoke in favor of the project and one person spoke against it. When he sat down, one person clapped. <laughs> so uh, as Jim indicated, uh, uh, even before there was an opportunity to testify, most of the members of the council expressed their uh, their enthusiastic support for the project. Uh, I think that the staff and all of the work that's gone into this over about two years of negotiation discussions with the with the property owner and uh, offering the council other options previously to acquire land, which they turned down, uh, had really laid the groundwork properly for this to be accomplished. Uh, but it's not old. And uh, uh, there is this meeting on the 20th, uh, next week, 
And uh, that's when the decisions are going to be made. And I'm told that the likely decisions are A, to approve the project, but also to approve a, uh, a nationwide consultant to help the, to work with the community to try to determine how best to use the property. And uh, that we're used to, right? We, we, uh, we want to be engaged, that type of thing. And then I'm told that uh, in October, there'll be another meeting and people need to attend that one. That one had to do with the financing of the project, okay? So this thing is not over yet, uh, and uh, our public input is still needed, and, and uh, support uh, is still needed because there's still opposition uh, to, to the project. So I thank you all for your participation. To get 400 emails in five days is not a, uh, you know, not insurmountable task. And uh, uh, it, uh, Jim, go ahead. Two points. Uh, first of all, in conjunction with the concept of making Coconut Road up the Corsica Road a medical corridor, which is what we're focusing on, a medical corridor, we feel that, I mean, that was originally our position. These cell that we brought forth in all the thought process and the planning and think about as uh, building goes down and you have these ups and downs, if you have a medical corridor built in town, and hopefully we can get a conjunction with FTCU to do a, a medical uh, program for doctors and so forth, how that will work out. It will always have a base that will be uh, standard and we won't have to worry about the ups and downs in the economy. And in conjunction with that, if you look at that site, that site makes the center point of a sterile. Because right below it is North Point, which they'll be developing, they already talk about developing that whole site. And more important, as younger people come in and want to get, uh, we're willing to come to work there, which we'll have with medical facilities, the first thing they say is, okay, where do we have recreation facilities? And if they're located in an area, and with Corshan Park, and that particular property that answers a lot of questions for those people. So, uh, as Don says, but this is this this sort of plan didn't come out in two days in the last few years. <laughs> We've been going at this what ten years now. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for so, sure. Uh, so it's just a matter of implementing. Yeah. And it's a pleasure working that we have a plan and we're working forward to get that plan. And we have residents who are up to having this done. And having a city that we don't have that center block and everybody at best, we have a gorgeous city in 10 years. And the big problem is that originally I thought we could start this in 10 years, in five years. But right now, people are coming in trying to buy property of the so much, so that we have to jump right now. Otherwise, if we don't, that original property time at time was $36 million. And we got the guys down to $25 million. So you can see that's a big big jump that we got. So we have to take advantage and we know the residents are behind this whole program. So we're going to make it. Ten years, you'll have the, you'll have the best city in all of the state, I'm sure. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Bob King is up next with the uh, transportation report. We always have transportation issues. We got a lot of people who we'll move around. And thank you, Bob, for all your hard work. Thanks, Don. Yeah, it, you know, it's exciting. We got all these new things going on. Now we got to figure out how do we get around in this <laughs> with all this development. Um, first one, um, Pete, where's the. Uh... Thank you, Rick. As the mayor's pointed out, the uh, final input for the uh, both the budget and the capital improvement plan will be at 530 on the 20th. And we, we've said that a bunch of times. We need to be have you there. The, uh, some of the elements within the capital improvement plan in the transportation area, uh, there's an $11 million pro program that that will take place over the next five years. Uh, there's the $26 million land acquisition. Uh, Stero Parkway is really the highest priority of the transportation projects within the village. Uh, currently, that's in the hands of the contractor that's doing the design phase. 
there will be some public input to know where that program stands. They're currently not scheduled, but uh, will be. Uh, the next uh, public review we don't have yet. The council voted to, uh, to, in, to hold the millage rate. So we're going to have all of this wonderful new development and our taxes aren't going to go up. The uh, county's capital improvement plan. Last month I spoke to you about uh, what was going on with the budget for the county. And uh, I indicated that there was zero dollars appropriated for the widening of Corkscrew Road. Well, it gives me great pleasure to tell you that that has changed. Uh, right at the moment, there is a program uh, that's been approved that is in the fiscal 18-19 budget for the design phase of Corkscrew Road improvement. And that'll be followed by uh, some right-of-way procurement and the construction phases to a total of $40,450,000. Uh, uh, the total proposed budget for 1819 transportation-wise is about $125 million. If you look at it in terms of the scheduling that they have laid out in their CIP, it shows fiscal 1819 as the design phase, right away 1920. Uh, the first of the construction phases in 2021 through 21-22 at 17.4 million. And then another 17.3 in fiscal 22-23 that would run out through 24-25. Uh, uh, that's then being a total appropriation of about $40 million. That's a, real, that's a real step forward. At this point in time, a month ago, we didn't know uh, when they were going to do the widening of Corkscrew. Now, it's, we're, we are a Tier 1 funded project. Uh, to go back again to the traffic study, and this study was put together by AIM Engineering and, and funded by uh, Community Development to look at the four communities that are being planned along Corkscrew Road uh, and what it's going to cost to make the improvements that this study has already identified, and that would be the four laning. Right now, the transportation costs associated with it are still not available. I was told just the other day that the vendor, AIM Engineering, has provided some uh, information to the county that is currently being reviewed by staff and the developers, and that likely some amendments are going to be sent back to AIM uh, for adjustment uh, to their report. I'm not going to make any suggestions about what that means. <laughs> we'll leave out for you. Is um, that going to de determine the proportionate share that we keep hearing about? Proportionate share is part of uh, the number eight task. And that's part of six, seven, and eight are the three elements that are not yet completed. Six is uh, what is the uh, cost associated with the, the, uh, the projects Verdana, Pepperland, The Place, and uh, Wild Blue. And then finally, task number eight is what's the proportionate share? We already understand that the proportionate share for The Place has been negotiated at $1,600 a unit. The best of my knowledge, they have not finished the negotiations on the other three projects. I have no reason to believe that they're gonna be significantly different. Um, what I'd like to do now, just take a moment and go through, and let's talk about those four projects and put them in perspective as to where do they stand at the moment. The place uh, has a comp plan amendment and zoning approved. Those two elements are important because if you're going to do some building in the DRGR, you have got to have an amendment to the comprehensive plan. That gets your density from one per 10 acre for upland and one for one for 20 acres, or one unit for 20 acres, for wetlands. Right at the moment, they have that in place. They have zoning for 1,325 units. Uh, they have residential construction that started. They've got over 200 building permits that have been issued. Wild Blue, directly across Corkscrew from Bellaterra, uh, their comp plan amendment is completed. Their zoning for 1,000 units is complete. The infrastructure is being put in right now. 
two pictures at the bottom, and I'll, I'll bring some more because it doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> they, they've moved in a lot more equipment. Uh, they have about 400 building permits that have been requested but not yet issued. The other two, Verdana at 1,425 units, their comp plan amendment is in the process. Uh, it has not yet been finally approved by uh, the hearing examiner, or comp plan, I'm sorry, the uh, local planning agency. The, uh, the zoning is in process. Pepperland Ranch is 700 units. Uh, their comp plan amendment has been approved. Their zoning has not been submitted. So these two projects are a little bit further down the road. And I think that could allow it to fit with the schedule that we've seen for the widening of Corks Group. Uh, the next transportation committee meeting is scheduled for next Thursday at, on the 21st at 9.30 at Finemark Bank. And I'd be perfectly willing to try to answer any questions you may have on the transportation. Yes. Uh, the 21st is the Friday. Overhead is going to start some ambitious next year. I'm sorry? The overhead on 21. Yeah. I mean, of course, you have to plan to start next year. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's the... <coughs> that'll, that's going to be... There's a six-laning program that's going to be introduced that'll go from Three Oaks Parkway to Ben Hill, and then there's going to be the uh, improvements to the interchange at I-75. That'll add the additional turn lanes, both northbound and southbound, and it'll also do some uh, on-ramp uh, activity. Uh, that also is planned starting fiscal uh, 1920. Uh, 18, 19, starting next, October. Next spring. Yes. Next spring. Good. Do you have it up there the 21st? Uh, that's Friday? You mean the 20th, I think. The 20th. I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. It's Thursday. It's Thursday's the 20th. Okay. Other comments or questions? Yeah. Bob, the 5.30 meeting on the 20th is going to be where? That's at Five Mark Bank. No, that's no. At, that's at Five Mark Bank. Oh, I'm sorry. Village that's Hall. Village Hall. Village Hall. Village Hall. Village Hall. Okay. Other questions or comments? Yes. I could ask. There was some short-term improvements for turn lane signage, et cetera. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I should have. Uh, right at the moment, the turn lane, that was kind of an interesting story because we had identified, actually, I had taken some pictures of some trucks that were blocking the intersection at Corkscrew and uh, Bellaterra going into the Wild Blue project. Uh, you can clearly see the traffic lights green and there's a great big car or equipment carrier sitting in the middle of the intersection. So I sent those to the county staff. It was four days later that a crew started to do a turn lane. And five days later, they were driving on it. Yep. So there was, that was an improvement that took place in record time. Uh, <laughs> since then, they have said that they're going to do some lighting, and they've done that. We now have signals both east and west of that traffic light that indicate that it's about to turn. This gives these big truck guys that are doing 60 a, an opportunity to maybe start to slow down because the light's going to turn red. Uh, they're going to put in a turn lane at the uh, preserve. That's going to be a little bit more difficult because that's, there's no median to use like they had at Bellaterra for their turn lane. I'm, I'm not sure when they're going to approach that. I haven't heard. Lou, have you heard anything on it? The Pinewood, the Pinewood extension is, is it probably the same category as the turn lane at the preserve. The center line of Corkscrew Road has been shifted significantly to the south. So if you try to put in a turn lane from going east on Corkscrew, you're going to almost have to remove the drainage ditch or the sidewalk in order to put that lane in. So they've got some work to do there to get that one in. Any? Thank you, Bob. Yes. Mostly just an announcement. I hope you're all seeing that the lighting is, has been on on 41, up and on. I don't know when it's going to be totally on all the time, but the highway lighting is up and running, and it's pretty wonderful. Good. Good. Thank you. 
Thanks, Joyce. Won't, won't be done until the fall. Fall for total fall. Had to take the lights down and put some new lights in. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Where's the traffic? Uh, Where's the moving on, our next uh, report is from Paul Durson on the uh, health committee. Paul? Thank you. Can I have the next slide? There, there's been a lot of discussion about the geriatrician, the, uh, the geriatrizing, I can't say it, it's like the, uh, making the, emer the Lee Health's geriatric emphasis. And one of those um, emphases was the geriatric emergency department. And I thought I would just take a second just to give you a little bit about what a geriatric emergency department is so that uh, you'll know. Uh, the concept of geriatric emergencies actually developed in around 1990 when there was an appreciation that older patients are not the same as everyone else. They have special needs. Uh, their, I don't want to say presentation, that's a fancy word, but the signs and symptoms that they have of disease are different than the middle-aged person and they have a lot of stuff going on. They're not just having one disease. And Emergency physicians, emergency nurses were uh, aware of this, but not comfortable with it. And that started a new uh, development to create some knowledge and structure to treat the increasing number of older patients, sometimes referred to as the silver tsunami. <laughs> the, Briefly, the geriatric emergency department has really basic four elements. One is it should be designed to be friendly to the older person. That deals with lighting, with signage, with floors, with railing. Uh, this emergency department, I spoke with Alex, will have uh, recliner chairs in some rooms, uh, much more comfortable for the older patient than laying on a bed or a gurney. Uh, processes in the emergency department will be different. There'll be more screening going on. Uh, there'll be more, uh, you know, like a fall prevention screening program, uh, things of that nature. Uh, more communication, more uh, communication within the department, more communication with uh, the other services that will be offered. The third thing is education. Uh, as I said earlier, we know very little about what's going on in, <coughs> in older people and, and people who practice need to know more about it and as more developments happen, there should be more education. And finally, community connection. The older person needs planning when they leave that emergency department to make sure they don't come back or to help assure that they don't come back again. So those are really the four elements which separate a geriatric emergency department from your standard run-of-the-mill emergency department. And the plan is to incorporate these in that new facility. Any questions on that before I go to slide two? Yes. Um, obviously, the, the Lee is going to be doing that. Do we have any input as to what NCH is doing in there? I don't. I don't know. But I would imagine one of the things the American <coughs> College of Emergency, the, the major Mer um, emergency medicine associations have developed guidelines for what you can do to call yourself a, and there's an accreditation program which now exists. What had been happening is it's really easy to hang up a sign saying we're a geriatric emergency department as a marketing tool. And so uh, I don't know what, le what NCH is doing. I imagine that they, if this one is being marketed as a geriatric emergency department, uh, I'm sure that the place across the street will be marketed the same way, but hopefully I know in the staffing of it, um, we're talking with Alex, they, they are bringing in folks who actually were trained in uh, programs which have geriatric emergency medicine. So there will be some leadership in there. Anything else on the geriatric emergency department? Are uh, they going to be certified? Uh, It'll part? take some time for that to happen. I see. Okay. okay. Next slide. Um, the other thing is we talked about Estero being a beautiful community, a growing community, a financially sound community. The health uh, committee thought we also should be a safe committee, community. And so we are moving forward to get 
a steroid designation as a safe community. Uh, there's a, it's an international organization, international safe communities. There's a U.S. safe community, national safe community, which is part of the Pan-Pacific Safe Community Federation. And it recognizes communities that have made a commitment. And the commitments we'll be making have to deal with uh, our accident or injury prevention program, uh, the traffic safety, uh, the recreational facilities being safety, so that it'll show that folks who want to move to Estero not only are interested in the things we've already talked about, but will be able to also call Estero a safe community. So we are working in towards that. So those are the two things we're up to. Any questions for uh, Walt? You notice this is the first time I stood up to make my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Report. And Pete, there's our next meeting, which is Friday the 21st. Okay. And that is Friday, right? It's that definitely is Friday. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Once they're dealing with Friday. Originally, I had it on my time. Right. It's Friday the 24th. Pete K. Galosi <laughs> and the environmental report. Thank you. So that was the cherry after the Yeah. I just wanted to take a few moments because uh, I found this kind of complicated myself. So I thought I'd help everybody here try to realize which Senate and how state Senate and state House districts you live in. The Florida House districts, um, 76 and 78, are shown up here in green. It's those communities on that side of the big black line that encompass the Vines and uh, Long Corkscrew Road, Grandiza, Stony Brook, Wild, Wild Cat Run, the Preserve, Bellaterra, and Corkscrew Shores. So basically the extension of the Cerro Parkway and Corkscrew Road on the east side of the village, and then 75 on the uh, west side of the village. Um, in this case, for District 76, that is uh, the house. <coughs> David Bogner is running against Ray Rodriguez, and that encompasses most of, of the Cerro area there. Going to the other side of the legislature, the Florida Senate District, uh, 27 and 28 is a little bit more complicated. The uh, boundary line between those two districts is not very logical. It runs along Corkscrew Road for part of the village down 41 and then the village line down towards uh, the Coconut Road area. So to help you figure out where your community lies in this, those that are kind of harder to see on the east side, Stony Brook, Stony Brook Wildcat Run, the Preserve, Bellatary, Corkscrew Shores are in 28. All of the brooks and the communities around Lowe's, that would be Wild, uh, excuse me, uh, Corkscrew Woodland and um, Just south of Kirksbury Road, there by uh, by Lowe's. I can't remember the name. These I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Those are also in 28, and then most of Benita, that is south of uh, the uh, see where it says the village line there. That's also 28. So in Senate District 28, um, Anissa Cream is running against uh, Kathleen Pasadamo. Switching to the 27th, which is the darker color to the uh, more or less the northwest, so north of Corkscrew Road and north of the village line on the west side of uh, 41. Those communities include the northern part of Pelican Landing, Coconut Shores, Marsh Landing, Fulton Lakes, Pelican Sound, uh, the Meadows, and Estero, I believe it's called, and West Bay. And anything north of those that I didn't mention are in 27. Um, Grandiza is fully in uh, 27 up to the extension of that road that no one wants to call 951. So the extreme <laughs> eastern part of Grandiza, which I believe they call their Savona neighborhood, is in District 28. Um, in 27, it is Elizabeth Benequisto running unopposed as far as I could find. No, there's not up to for your turn, okay. All right. He's in the middle of her turn. Oh, 
So in any case, um, only in 28 in Estero will you be voting for a uh, uh, state senator. Yeah. Any questions about that? Where you live and what, what district you live in for both the House and the Senate? Uh, one major change on uh, Perks Group Crossing, just found out uh, two days ago that the uh, Planning and Zoning Board postponed the, uh, this project coming before it instead of September 18th, which would have been next uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. They've now postponed it to October 16th tentatively, and we'll find out more about that as the time comes. But uh, Perks Group Crossing, uh, just to review, is this area right in here is kind of a backwards uh, letter L. It is sandwiched between the Preserve and Corkscrew and Wildcat Run, all on the south side of Corkscrew Road here, 75 over here. Edison Farms is down uh, the lower part of the drawing, and here's the, the various stats. 625 units, total of almost 400 acres. Roughly half would be developed, the other half are um, preserved. Uh, the wildlife, excuse me, wetlands that would be preserved. So the key date again is act, right now is October 16th, tentatively before the planning and zoning boards. The yes, south park, the south park is part is going to be the preserve area. Yes, yes. Well, uh, you can see the the homes are this area that looks you know, developed with uh, lakes and streets and so on. The darker green area right here is the area that would be preserved. Where's the wildlife crossing underneath Corkscrew? It's proposed to be right about here. This area, this uh, rectangle right here is the preserve of Corkscrew. This area is the western preserve of the preserve of Corkscrew. It is a, uh, not only is it a, a preserve that the preserve of Corkscrew maintains, but it is a flowway of, uh, and a branch of the Estero River. So wild blue is up here. There is a south slough that comes down this way. You'll see if you're over here, it's very wet. The proposed underpass would be right about here. And that would be the flowway, and water would flow south through here, um, kind of around this corner of this, this area here of Alcantara, <coughs> through here, and ultimately through this preserve area into Edison Farms down at the bottom. So Bob, do we know if when the riding of the road they'll put in that wildlife crossing? Yeah, that's the plan. Okay. It'll be put in when they do the four laning. Okay. The interesting thing about what Pete was just showing is the wildlife pathway will use the preserved portion of the preserved community. If you look at the, the animals are going to come down that and then have to make a joggle right there. Yeah. If those animals decide to go straight, they end up in Bosco Court. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is part of Belterra. Yes. <laughs> we all love wildlife, but the name of this street, Bob. Uh, this is Bosco Court. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, just to uh, where's the wildlife on the north side of Corkscrew, uh, uh, wild blue? Well, there's a uh, yeah. This drawing doesn't show it, but there this uh, slough. This is actually a slough through here. So the flowway is a slough, and it, it extends up this way and it goes up to the northeast, and um, uh, go, it will go up to. Uh, the northeastern part of, of Wild Blue. I will mention that Wild, uh, excuse me, Corkscrew Crossing wants to install a 50 foot wide channel or ditch or moat, whatever you want to call it, on this border. And so with a six foot fence on their side, that the idea there is <coughs> that wildlife coming through here would be um, coaxed to stay in a north-south uh, direction and not go into the, the corkscrew crossing. <laughs> However, there's nothing to provide to prevent them to go to the east, <coughs> into the preserve, and ultimately into Bellaterra. There is just a, a scattering of lakes. Uh, they're not uh, uh, fully connected, but they're broken along this side of the preserve. 
And so animals can go, come up and if they decide they want to go east, there's plenty of opportunities to go east this way. So, here we are. So the entrance to that uh, crossing is uh, the south entrance of the Wild Blue right now. Right, right there. the line goes up. The See, entrance of the corkscrew crossing in the Wild Blue commercial oh, yeah. area. That would be right about here. Yeah. If you drive Corkscrew Road, you'll see uh, this whole area is completely changed. It's all dug up, and there is a large lake being built right about here. But that is about the main yeah. entrance of proposed entrance of Corkscrew Crossing, which would be matched with the westernmost entrance of Wild Blue, the eastern one being over here by Bellaterra. And then there's, by the way, there's a north one up on the Lico Road. And the police knows that was all permitted by the county, yes. not by the Sarah. We know. Cecil has promised a traffic light on Corkscrew. Well, this this has been postponed for a month, so we'll yeah. be back. We can talk about it again next month. Yeah. Uh, so. yes. Just a question. Um, the wildlife crossing looks like it's in the midst of a slough. Is that correct? Yes, it is. So, it, it am is. I right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. So when the animals make this, this turn, which I'm sure will be signs and so forth, yeah. <laughs> um, are they swimming through the slough? <laughs> it's it's going to be, a, as I understand it, it's, uh, it'll be a box culvert. So something on the order of 8 feet tall, 20 feet wide, the road will go above this culvert. And yes, the animals will go through that. Um, it won't always be wet. I mean. Uh, Yes, now this, this time of year it's very wet in there. In the drier season it's, it's pretty dry. But the animals will be able to cross through there. Um, I think we'll I'm sure they'll be trained to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Ellie, one of those. They usually, when they go these box holders, they usually have a like, hydrologic conveyance underneath them so that some of the water goes underneath and therefore keeps it rather dry. But there is still a chance of flooding, absolutely. We need to move on, so uh, we'll try to get get out of here before I knew. Uh, Hurricane uh, Florence did us one favor. They sent us uh, Jim Shields back to Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> so that he could give a report for the uh, Education Outreach Committee. Thank you, Jim, for yeah. joining us. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, here on behalf of uh, the Education Outreach Council. Uh, Jim Gilmartin is the chair. Um, very quickly, um, the stakeholders are Angela Fisher, Junior Achievement. Uh, Vanessa Santiago is uh, her program manager that's working with us. Dr. Wanda Creel, uh, Chief of Curriculum at Lee Schools, and uh, Dr. Um, Denise Carlin, who's a strategy and relationship. Uh, we're working with Lee Health, Molly Grubbs, Ryan King of Hertz. These people have stepped forward. We have more than 28 different entities uh, that comprise the 76 volunteers we have for the uh, four Estero area schools. Uh, the principals from Pine Woods Elementary, Three Oaks Elementary, Three Oaks Middle, and Estero High School, they've been absolutely outstanding. Their staff, we're working together. Um, we've got 85% of the lead volunteers that have signed up and committed for the fall term for the two elementary schools and the middle school. We just got the assignment for the classes for Estero High School this week. And uh, I had a meeting at 9 o'clock this morning with a lead person from a wealth management uh, relationship manager. Uh, they're going to step forward, uh, Kenny James, and I met with her. And uh, we'll get the Estero classes, uh, high school classes filled in. They start uh, October 29th. Uh, elementary school will start late this month, early October. Um, we, we're going top down and bottom up. Uh, we've invited parents of the students of, that are in these classes, second grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, eleventh uh, grade, to come and be a part of the process. And, and parents have volunteered. Uh, they're not doing the heavy lifting, but they're in the classroom. Every classroom engagement, uh, the teacher will be in that room to handle decorum. Uh, We've got, uh, of the 76 volunteers who stepped forward, 52% uh, uh, live here year round. Some of those people are in this room as I speak. Uh, 14 to 16 different uh, gated communities, uh, seven different banks, 
uh, Lee Health, Hertz, people have stepped forward. I want to volunteer. I want to be a part of this. Uh, uh, Marriott Hotel, uh, the uh, uh, beat boat uh, uh, excursion uh, company has stepped forward. The ownership. Uh, so we're we're just not we're working wide across the community. It's 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 great to see and great to experience. It is a community wide initiative. Um, uh, that's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to say that everybody's working together. I think that's great. Uh, Nick Betos and Kevin Tolliver are working together on the Lee County Schools. Uh, people are volunteering. People are stepping forward for the various things the schools need to have happen. And, and that's, I, I think that's off to a very good start. It takes time to get that going. Uh, FCCU Institute for Entrepreneurship, we're working with them. Uh, uh, they're doing some great things. Uh, there was a, a uh, special on uh, Wink uh, TV recently with Dr. Kaunui and uh, the, the, the great work she's doing with veterans. And uh, uh, we have two members of ECCL, of our Outreach Council, that are on the advisory board of the Institute for Entrepreneurship of FGCU. So we're, we're plugged in, we're connected, and uh, uh, we're, we are working with them. So. Uh, with all of that, uh, uh, I would say that uh, stuff is going to happen. There will be hiccups. Uh, we're the first uh, group that is ever working together with a village, with Nick Betos that have stepped in and working with the schools, and it's it's going well. And uh, uh, we'll be there to help out uh, whenever we can. And and thank you for your time.